This morning we are continuing our sermon series, Discovering Jesus as Friend, as Teacher, as Savior, as Lord, as Way, and as Presence. And in the series we're, we're asking the question, who is Jesus really? And what does it actually mean to follow Jesus? And so I think one of the best ways that we can answer that question is by looking at the different ways that we experience Jesus. So this morning we're going to be exploring Jesus as Savior. I want you to stand as we hear God's word this morning. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The term Savior is is one of the most popular terms that we Christians use to describe Jesus. Uh, Here in the kind of the buckle of the Bible belt, we hear Jesus referred to as Savior all the time. Uh, Maybe you've seen those those neon signs by the highway that says Jesus saves. Um, Allie and I, I went to a wedding that I officiated last, last night in Topoco at Lodge. And on the way there, we passed this uh, tree and it had a sign that said John 3.16. And I thought, hey, I'm preaching on that tomorrow. And then we went a little bit further and we saw another sign that said Jesus saves. I said, hey, I'm preaching on that tomorrow. Um, but maybe you've seen those signs. Jesus is our Savior. We know that Jesus comes and saves us from sin and death. But it's odd that despite how often we use that term Savior, it only appears twice in the Gospels to describe Jesus. Only two times does it show up and attributed uh, to Jesus. The first occurrence is at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. At Jesus' birth, he's called Savior. And then the second occurrence is in John's Gospel where neighbors tell the Samaritan woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know this is truly the Savior of the world. Now, even though Savior only appears twice in the Gospels, we know that Jesus is the Savior of the world. This is good news. This is a good thing. This is a positive thing. Jesus saves. But I can think of a time in my life where those words didn't feel like good news to me. Now, let me explain. One day when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I was at home. My parents were at work. My older sister was there with me. But there was a, somebody at the door. They rang the doorbell. So I went to the door. Now, kids, don't go answer the door when your parents aren't at home, okay? That was something I shouldn't have done. I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I did it anyway. Now, I opened the door. And there was this strange man standing on my porch. And he introduced himself by saying that he was the local undertaker. And then he asked me, a middle schooler, if I'd ever thought about my funeral before. (laughs) And then he said he was going door to door asking people, are you ready to die? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if you haven't, you will burn in the fiery pits of hell forever. That stranger was basically trying to sell me some fire insurance, I think. But I have to say, I was terrified. I was terrified. This strange man came to me and said this. And Now, I knew I was already a Christian. I went to church. I was saved. I was a believer in Christ. I was a follower of Christ. And my pastor was a good pastor. He told me the truth. I knew all the things. But it felt like this guy was trying to scare me into accepting Jesus. It felt like this guy was trying to kind of terrify me and threaten me into following Jesus. And all of a sudden, that good news of Jesus Christ didn't feel like good news to me. The motivation behind that message to me felt like it was based on fear, not based on love. And the Apostle Paul 
tells us God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Following Jesus out of fear, it might work for a while. Fear can be a good motivator, but I don't think that that's the way that God really wants to have a relationship with us. I think God longs to have a relationship with us that is, that is love, full of love and, and full of trust. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and I'm here to say that that is truly good news. Despite what Jane might tell you, it's good news. Jesus has entered into the world to save us from our sin and death. Jesus saves us by offering us eternal life. Jesus saves us from our human sin. But the word, salva the word salvation means even more than saving us from sin and death. The word salvation comes from a Latin word, which means salvus, which means being made whole, uninjured, safe, and in good health. In other words, Jesus not only forgives us and saves us, but Jesus is there to redeem us, to make us whole. That's what we talk about when we talk about salvation. As Christians, we are called to believe in Jesus as our Savior, not because we're afraid of punishment, but because we truly believe that Jesus has come to save us, to make a difference in our lives right here and right now. Jesus was born into this world to save us, to transform our world. Jesus has come to end oppression and violence, to allow mercy to reign, to bring light and love to a broken and dark world. It's not about just what might happen in the future when we die, but Jesus has come to save us right here and right now in the world that we live in. As John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. This verse, that's the verse that comes to my mind when I think about Jesus as Savior. Notice that verse doesn't actually use the word Savior, but it describes what it means for Jesus to be our Savior. God loves us so much that He gave us his only son. God offers us salvation through Jesus Christ. God does this because we need saving and because he loves us. We know the world is broken. We know that we need saving. As Apostle Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the definition of sin means missing the mark. How many of us have ever missed the mark? We miss the mark all the time. We make mistakes. We fall short. We know that we have room to grow. We need Jesus to come and to save us. In her book, Freeing Jesus, Diana Butler Bass offers another definition for sin, which I really like. She says, sin is a rejection of the beauty and goodness of God's image in every person. Jesus lived such fullness perfectly, and he revealed the deep wisdom of that truth. Christ the Word speaks this into the world. The light of the world, the flame of our hearts, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. We can't do it on our own. We can't save ourselves. We need God's grace to come into our lives and move us from our sin toward God's salvation. John Wesley, the, the founder of the Methodist movement, he talks about three main movements of grace. Provenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. And when he describes these three graces, he uses the illustration of a house. And he says that grace is like a house that God has built for us. Uh, with this house, we don't have to worry about architects and contractors and plumbers and electricians. We don't have to worry about going to the bank and making a, uh, a payment on a mortgage or getting a loan to own the house. Instead, this house of grace is given to us completely free. Just like grace itself is given to us completely free. There's nothing we can do to earn it. We don't deserve it. It isn't forced on us, but it's a gift offered to us that we can accept. And John Wesley says the, the front porch of that house of grace is prevenient grace or preventing grace. Uh, this is uh, the porch, the platform that we all start out on. We start out, all of us, just by being born as children of God, receiving God's prevenient grace. This is the grace that comes before we even realize it. So maybe there's a part in your life where you can look back and say, wow, I see how God was working in that instance. I didn't notice it at the time, 
But God, God's grace was there in that moment even when I didn't recognize it. That's, that's provenient grace. That's the porch of the house. And that provenient grace prepares us for justifying grace or justification. Uh, this justifying grace is the pardoning grace. It's the grace that makes you justifying. Okay, don't laugh at that. That was bad, I know. Uh, but justifying grace that's the, acts as the doorway. It's the pardoning grace. It's the forgiving grace. It's, it's the word we use for salvation. That justifying grace is, is when we choose. We make that decision to open the door and to go inside the house. That, that's the, the door. That's justifying grace. That moment that we experience God's salvation. And then that same moment when we open that door, that's not where our journey ends. We don't just say, hey, I'm saved. I'm done. I don't have to go to church anymore. I don't have to pray anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm good. No, we're, we're called to continue that journey on. And, and that's what we call sanctifying grace or sanctification. It's a word that means holy. And that sanctifying grace is the inside of the house. All the rooms, all those rooms that we can go in and explore represent the way that we grow deeper in our faith. Um, that's what we're called to do. We spend most of our life striving for that sanctifying grace to be made holy as God is holy, to be more like Christ each and every day. That's what that sanctifying grace is. The Reverend Adam Hamilton uh, points out that in the Wesleyan understanding of grace, it really has two meanings. Uh, the first meaning is that grace is a quality of God's character whereby God loves, blesses, and forgives humanity despite our sin. And the second meaning of that grace is God's active work by the Spirit to draw us to God and to restore us to what God created us to be. But God's salvation and God's grace can sometimes be difficult to accept. Sometimes it's hard to just accept a free gift that's given to you. Uh, several years ago, I was with a group of men from the Emmaus community, and we went into the Bledsoe County Correctional Complex for about a week where we ministered to a group of about 30 prisoners. And we went in every morning, and we left every evening. We didn't spend the night there, which I was kind of thankful for. But um, each day we'd go into the, in the, into the prison, and we would hear these men. We, we would talk to them. We would hear their stories. We would pray with them. And a lot of these men, what I came to realize, were they were just normal people that had made some terrible mistakes in their lives. And as I talked to them, I heard their stories of hopelessness and grief and pain, of their regrets. And there was one individual named Tim. He's a young man, and, and I could tell he was just getting eaten up by his grief, by his pain. And we were having this conversation, and he was telling me part of his story. And we were talking, and, and he looked at me with just tears streaming down his face. And he said, what can I do to fix this? And I was like, I can't fix this. There's nothing you can do to fix this. And I know I wish I had the perfect scripture. I wish I had prayed the, the perfect prayer. Um, I wish I had said the perfect thing. But, but Tim hadn't quite come to the place in his life where he could receive God's grace, where he could receive God's forgiveness. He, he couldn't receive forgiveness for himself. And so we had a conversation. We talked about that and and I don't think Tim was quite ready to open that door of grace. I think he was close. But I know that he was on the porch of Provenia Grace, that he had experienced God's grace. And that, that was preparing him. But you know, one thing that, that gives me some hope in that story, and I think there's a lot of hope in that story, but, but Tim's not alone. Um, in fact, he's with some pretty good company. Throughout the Christian church throughout history, we can think of, I think, numerous examples of people who struggled to receive forgiveness, that struggled to receive God's grace, to struggle to, to receive God's salvation in their lives. For example, the Apostle Paul. He started out as a man named Saul. He was a Pharisee. He strived uh, to earn his salvation by obeying all the Jewish laws and customs. And then on the road to Damascus, he had this blinding light encounter where he received God's grace where he realized that Jesus had already done everything necessary for his salvation, that there was nothing he could do to earn it himself, but it was a free gift given to him. There's another story. Martin Luther, Protestant reformer, also really struggled with this idea of, of accepting God's saving grace in his life. He was desperately trying to do all he could 
to receive, uh, earn his own uh, favor with God. And, and in fact, he wrote in his, his journal, when I was a monk, I wearied myself greatly for almost 15 years with daily sacrifice, tortured myself with fastings, vigils, prayers, and other very rigorous works. I earnestly thought to acquire righteousness by my works, nor did I think it possible I should ever forget this life. Luther was eventually able to accept God's justifying, God's saving grace into his life. He realized that there was no way that he could earn God's love. There was nothing he could do, but it was a free gift given to him. And then there's John Wesley. I've already mentioned him before in this, ser in this sermon, but um, he also really struggled with receiving God's grace into his life. He would, he would do, much like Martin Luther, wake up early in the mornings and pray. He would do all these acts of, of righteousness. He would receive communion as much as he could. He would visit the prisoners and give to the poor. And those are all wonderful and great things that we need to do as Christians. But Wesley had, had, had done this to the point where it was consuming him. And he was really trying to earn God's favor in his life. But then on May 24th, 1738, this is Allie's favorite story. Um, Wesley went to this Moravian meeting on Aldersgate Street. And he heard Martin Luther's preface to the Romans being read, this, this commentary on the Bible. And he was moved. And he wrote in his journal, I felt my heart strangely warmed. Have any of you ever felt your heart strangely warmed? He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Sometimes we hold ourselves captive because we feel unworthy of receiving God's grace in our lives. And you know what? We are unworthy. We don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. And that's why it's grace. That's why it's given to us freely. I like what Frederick Buechner writes in his book, Secrets in the Dark. He says, Jesus saves whom? Jesus saves Joe, saves Charlie, Ellen, saves me, saves you. Just the names, without any Mr. or Mrs., without any degrees or titles or social security numbers, just who we are, no more, no less. Through God's justifying grace, through God's saving grace, we can find freedom in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God of salvation, God of grace, we thank you for being a God who is willing to send your son on the cross for us. We thank you for being a savior who offers us grace, even though we don't deserve it. May we accept your grace this day. May we be redeemed by your love for us. May you allow us to step through the door of the house of grace and experience your justifying grace and your sanctifying grace that moves us to become more and more like your son, Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking more about this idea of how Jesus comes into our lives and calls us to move forward as Christians and what that looks like. So I hope you can come back next week and experience some of that. Um, at this time, I want to invite you to stand as we uh, join together in our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, a very fitting song for our service this morning.